thank you. I'm sorry to bring you back from the future, back to the everyday <laughs> life of a practicing <laughs> neurologist. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> uh, and I would like to thank the chairs for inviting me here. I also like the title very much, uh, and that I you know, had to think a bit. So I'll skip this. Uh, and I'll turn immediately to the answer. Yes. <laughs> but then also no. <laughs> And then it's a limited durability of this prediction. And I must say, I, I talked with my legal counselor before coming here. Uh, and part of the reason for that is uh, what we have in our practice. I mean, we have different kinds of people. Uh, and we'll get back to why. So we have an ever-increasing number of tools in our toolbox. S some of you. I have written applications, and you like this buzzword, personalized medicine. Um, but what does it really stand for? I mean, we want to have better means of selecting the right drug for the right person. Uh, there are some big efforts. There's a big EU project called Multiple MS, where this is one of the main objects. But I wonder, is this really the most kind of uh, the best avenue? Um, or could we already today say that some drugs are better than others? So what we try to do is uh, we try to weigh benefit against risk. And the benefit is obviously dependent on the type of drug, but also on the type of patient. And the same is true for the risk. And about 125 years ago, uh, William Osler, had the same problem as I think we have today. Um, I wonder, um, is it an art or is it a science? So what we want to do may also differ depending on or the, the goals with the drug uh, might differ if you ask a, a neurologist or a patient. So it's difficult to find really big studies on this, but we did the questionnaires among Swedish and US patients and neurologists and asked what, what's the most important long-term goal with a DMT. And the patient said quality of life and the neurologist said lowering the risk of disability. And I think that was pretty obvious. Uh, the problem with quality of life is of course it's soft measure and it's uh, difficult to know what it stands for, but we could say that efficacy of a drug is important, safety, but also tolerability. And I think this is something we have lived with for a long time that, I mean, we know some of our drugs give quite bad side effects, not dangerous ones, uh, but they uh, really lower quality of life. And interestingly then also, I mean, things change Someone said that patients have Facebook groups and they look on the internet, and that might affect uh, the drug survival, the persistence on a drug. I mean, there's data on injectable therapies showing that it's about 50% chance that the patient remains on therapy after two years. In fact, it seems to be even lower now in Sweden. So these are nationwide data. And Right now, well, looking at those starting 2014, it's, you know, if you flip the coin, you have a greater chance of getting what you want than you know, starting a certain patient on, a, on injectable, at least in Sweden. Um, so if you turn to anti-CD20, so why is this interesting? Well, first of all, uh, there are several different drugs uh, that are uh, cell depleting and they deplete uh, cells of the B cell lineage, perhaps a small proportion even of T cells, but it's early B cells, naive B cells, mature B cells, memory B cells, and perhaps a bit of plasma blast, but not plasma cells. And the plasma cells are the important thing for producing um, immunoglobulin G. Um, so, I mean, many people perceive that anti-CD20 will be something that affects antibodies, but in fact, you see very little effect on IgG, at least if you follow over a couple of years. But you do see effects on, for example, IgM, uh, even within one year or two. 
So the studies performed so far have been, I'm probably not taking up all, but the, the, the bigger ones and some early studies on, on rituximab, and then the bigger later studies, uh, especially with ocrelizumab. Most of them have been placebo controlled except for uh, the ocrelizumab studies, which were con um, compared to interference. Uh, still, we, we don't really have uh, good comparative data comparing with high effective drugs. Uh, still, the, it's a whopping um, decrease in the risk of having a, a contrast enhancing lesion compared to interference with ocrelizumab in both these studies. So uh, presumably the effect is, is, is high. So looking at real life data, because I think here in the morning we heard about comorbidities. I mean, in, in, in randomized controlled trials, we have a highly selected group of patients, maybe excluding some of the ones with really high disease activity and also those with certain comorbidities. So how does it work in, in, in real life? So these are data, fresh data from uh, the Swedish MS registry and goes back as far as 2000, 2018. All treatment naive patients starting a drug and you see that we switch and we switch and switch and switch. Some people switch even further. But this is a bit unfair. Things change over time. So if we look at the more recent data from 2012, these are patients starting a first line therapy and still we see then that uh, traditional first line therapies, many patients switch onwards. Uh, even with the more novel treatments, there's quite a bit of change. So Sabre here. Uh, and with rituximab, uh, it's a much bigger retention. So people tend to, to stay on that drug, first line, second line, or third line. Um, together, I mean, um, people starting rituximab seem to uh, retain the drug. Uh, this accumulates the total number of ongoing treatments. Uh, we can see in general that injectable therapies has gone down in Sweden. Uh, and let's say more novel therapies, they have plateaued. So you have new patients starting, but also patients quitting. So they keep rather stable here. Uh, in general, we see a shift towards more, more high effective treatments. And an interesting phenomenon is the, the big geographical spread. So we have certain regions where almost all patients are treated with rituximab and there's this north-south gradient. Uh, so the more populated areas of Sweden uh, in, in the Stockholm area, uh, almost 60% of patients on rituximab and then a quarter in the south and in the west respectively. Um, if you look at comparative effectiveness with rituximab, we don't have a lot uh, in, in the prior literature. Uh, there's uh, this placebo controlled <coughs> phase two trial and then this tri trial in primary progressive MS where you see an effect in a subpopulation of patients, younger patients and those presenting with a uh, contrast enhancing lesion at baseline. Uh, we looked in a retrospective observational design then taking advantage of these differences in geographical use of, of, of different drugs. So we compared uh, three different centers with uh, high use of fingolimod, high use of uh, nataliz, sorry, rituximab, or in Stockholm where we had a bit of both. And rituximab came out significantly better in <coughs> both uh, effect, effectiveness and also with regard to reported adverse events and also the number of patients <coughs> retained on therapy. If we look at treatment naive patients, um, we had a county uh, of Sweden where about 82% started with Traximab and in Stockholm it was 18% 2012 to 2015. And there was a big, not taking into account, uh, I mean, the, the choice of drug, uh, the, the drug survival was much better in uh, the one, uh, the county choosing rituximab as the first treatment. And in the accumulated figures, there's very few relapses. Uh, and this is a treatment naive population. And generally, I would say effects are better in that population. Um, there's a, a third comparison now with people starting either of these drugs after uh, a switch from 
uh, injectable therapies based on lack of efficacy. And uh, natalizumab and rituximab comes out better than um, fingolimod. And in terms of drug survival, rituximab comes out better because of the um, GCV uh, problem with, with natalizumab. Uh, so comparative effectiveness looks uh, pretty convincing, but still you need randomized controlled trials. So we have an effort now uh, led by my colleague Anders Svenningsson, a nationwide study with a large number of centers. Um, so we're approaching probably by the end of November the target of 200 patients. It's not a huge study, but still. And it's also comparing then with uh, dimethylfumarate, which is the, the, the most common second choice for first-line therapy in Sweden. And we also use uh, a low-dose regimen, so first dose, a single dose, 1,000 1, megs, and then uh, every six months, 500 megs. And patients in this study will be offered to roll over in an extension study with six or 12-month dosing to try to um, uh, give lower doses. We also have a very big effort with um, looking at long-term outcomes with all types of therapies. So we include all patients starting with first-line therapy from 2011 or doing a first switch after 2011 and are followed at any of Sweden's seven university clinics. And the theoretical population here is 3,700. And we're now at 3,235 recruited. So, I mean, we basically recruit everyone that knows a bit of Swedish and are willing to, to uh, participate. And a uh, vast majority of patients do that. Uh, we do then a structured follow-up with yearly uh, disability ratings and uh, a number of, of patient-reported outcomes and also national um, uh, a similar MRI protocol, so we will have to, the possibility to look at uh, volumetrics, uh, hopefully on a, on a large proportion of patients. Um, but the second side, so if comparative effectiveness looks good, uh, the, the second side is as important, I would say, the safety side. Um, uh, and we have the possibility in, in Sweden, um, I know, other countries as, as well, but we have a, a long history of, of uh, a number of different registrations. I mean, we have a personal identity number uh, from the 30s, I think. Uh, so everyone is tagged with the number, and that's uh, good and bad. I mean, you, the, the tax authorities and everyone knows your personal number. But it's good because you can track patients all through these different types of registers. The problem with this register is or that they have very little information on the, on the disease characteristics, and we know that is important. But, I mean, you can look for comorbidities here, um, but uh, the registry is then vital to have the information of what type of drug you are on, and uh, if it's, especially if it's not a prescription drug or disability level, and, and also the patient-reported outcomes. <clears throat> uh, we have looked so far at three things that we believe are important, serious infections, cancer, and all-cause mortality. So with infections, and this was presented recently at ECTRIMS, uh, we can see that um, it's a fairly large proportion of uh, population of patients, uh, fairly large number of patient years as well. Uh, we can see that all uh, high effective drugs here are, they have a, a higher risk of, of uh, uh, being associated with the hospitalization for an infection uh, compared to injectable therapies. With herpes infections, there's a slightly lower risk, not significantly compared to those, to fingolimod and natalizumab. And if you look at respiratory tract infections or urinary tract infections, looking for prescri prescribed drugs, and here we are also looking at things prescribed by general practitioners. Uh, there's not so much differences. So with cancer, uh, we looked at compared rituximab with fingolimod and atalizumab, and uh, there was no significant differences. Uh, numerically, also compared to the general population, in crude numbers, uh, we had fewer uh, events in the rituximab group. 
Um, so there's no signal for a, a generally increased uh, cancer risk, at least over the medium term. We also looked at breast cancers. Uh, we found one single case uh, corresponding to a rate of 2.46 per 10,000 person years. Uh, in the ocrelizumab studies, uh, the rate was substantially higher, but that could be, I mean, just bad luck. Uh, so we need to follow this, of course, more uh, closely uh, for a longer time period. Uh, all cause mortality, uh, looking here, uh, we found two deaths. Uh, it has not been updated with, um, we can see people that die, but it takes some time before we get the date on cause of death. Uh, so this has to be updated. Um, translates to a, a general risk, risk of mortality that is actually numerically lower than the general population that might depend on the fact that we don't start treatment on a severely sick patient or that our patients are not practicing motorbiking or, or dangerous things. Uh, so at least rather comforting. So then even if this looks pretty good, uh, we are probably all aware of, of the lack of data or long term. Uh, well, there are rheumatologists treating with CD20, but they use other algorithms and so on. So um, we tr should try to minimize uh, long term risks with uh, anti CD20. Uh, and I think here, one big problem with uh, anti CD20, we don't really know why it works. I mean, MS is a T cell driven disease and, and why, I mean, taking out the B cells, what, why does it have uh, such a kind of, well, rather striking effect? <coughs> uh, we had uh, two detectives here, uh, Ivan Jelsic in uh, Roland Martin's group in Zürich and Fayez al who's here somewhere, uh, now back in Stockholm, who published this study uh, recently, which gives a rather beautiful uh, model for how memory B cells interact with memory T cells, and this is purely antigen dependent. So, by blocking the HLA or CD4, uh, you can uh, block T cell activation. Also, by taking away the T cells in a rather beautiful experiment, I think uh, uh, they took or we sent blood from patients initiating rituximab, so at baseline, it was a higher rate of proliferate proliferation of T cells, and uh, three months after rituximab, the proliferation was uh, substantially subdued or, or there was no proliferation. If you then added to that sample uh, B cells from the same patient taking a baseline, they started to proliferate again. So this seems to be a, 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 a well, at least experimentally and a non-redundant pathway of, of keeping uh, um, supposedly uh, ensofletogenic T cells uh, activated. Uh, so that turns into this. I mean, we talk about induction treatments and we talk about continuous treatments. Uh, we know it's rather easy to put these drugs in this group and these drugs in this group. Uh, but um, where is rituximab? I mean, should we keep the B cells low, uh, any type of B cells, or do we actually take away a certain clones of, of pathogenic memory B cells that will take long, or if they will come back? We don't really know that. Um, so for the future, we should identify better markers for these pathogenic cells and, and perhaps uh, follow those, and maybe we should have individualized uh, dosing regimens in order to keep the, the immune suppression low and especially not treating people not needing a retreatment. Um, we should try to develop DMTs directly targeting these B or T cells. And uh, Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors are in clinical trials, at least two I'm aware about. And interestingly also in, in uh, uh, Evans and Fye's study, you could achieve the same effect by blocking BTK. So maybe BTK is uh, uh, a better strategy, strategy than, than killing all B cells. So turning into some cases here. Um, 
this a young woman, mother with MS, and since her teenage years, she had tremor that worsens with, with, uh, with stress, so supposedly essential tremor. Her general practitioner referred her to an MRI, largely based, based on you know, worries and, and her, uh, her, her, uh, her mother with MS. And this shows uh, a number of lesions typical of MS. No contrast enhancement. There was no spinal MRI run. Uh, no anamnestic relapses, and the clinical status was uh, without signs. So this is what we would call radiologically isolated syndromes. However, she had the pretty high neurofilament. And those of you not working with neurofilament in the CSF, this is what you would see with, uh, let's say, moderate relapse. Uh, um, it's a little bit higher. Well, we did a study with people starting natalizumab, and, and it's uh, slightly higher than, than that group of patients. So she was started on, on rituximab. Uh, there has been no signs of disease. And the question is, of course, how, how long should one treat? Maybe one should stop now. Maybe this is enough for, a, for quite a while. Uh, so here I would say that this is the only drug we would need. Um, however, there are more things than EDSs and MRI to MS. And this is from the MS registry, so you can I mean, real time, get a, a matching of your patient uh, to a control group from the MS registry, in this case, 405 patients. And this is the match group in different measures. So EDSS, this is MSIS, SDMT, uh, fatigue scale, EQ5D, uh, workability. Um, and yeah, this is the reference group, and the red dots are this particular patient. And we can see uh, that, I mean, she has some degree of fatigue. She scores a bit uh, low on the MSIS-29. Of course, there could be signs of MS disease. We don't know if this is purely psychological or if this is a consequence of, of lesions she has accumulated. Uh, second patient, uh, about 10 years older, uh, started treat treatment with the methyl fumarate. Uh, she had uh, something that was difficult to exclude the relapse. And, she had uh, a couple of new T, small T2 lesions, but compared to an MRI done before starts, you never know if this is active or not. So a CSF showed, uh, well, high levels of neurofilament. She was switched to rituximab, and yeah, she, she volunteered to do, I want to do another CNF. I want to see if my neurofilament is lower than it was and has been stable since. And this is her profile will be interesting to see this group of patients over longer time periods and see if they keep stable. So here, yes, although I took away the exclamation mark. Uh, you never know. Uh, third case, a man, <coughs> uh, a little bit younger than the previous woman, diffuse disease onset and then uh, relapse. I mean, this is no longer existing, but still progressively relapsing. Uh, a rather bad MRI picture. There's a lot of atrophy here, a lot of lesions. Uh, pretty high neurofilament. Started on rituximab. A couple of new T2 lesions, but no contrast enhancement compared to that MRI. Still neurofilament a bit high. Uh, probably anti-CD20 is not the solution uh, long term here. Um, Fourth case, uh, this is a man with uh, typical primary progressive MS who initiated ocrelizumab here. And you can see his neurofilament is not that high. It's much lower than the previous patients. And that one year follow-up is 15% reduced. Is that good? Is it bad? I mean, uh, if you look at the disability, uh, I mean, progression risk in the trial, this is maybe what you would expect in a, uh, in a group of patients. Some patients will have uh, I mean, more higher neurofilament at start and may respond better. Um, but anti-CD20 is not uh, the solution here for progressive disease, I think. It has effects, uh, but it's not huge effects. Also, this is not anti-CD20, but another, a couple of other types of therapy. This was a man 
who started um, interference here, uh, which looked pretty good. Uh, no relapses, and then he had a, a, a mild relapse, and then a much more severe relapse, but still only EDS is three, a brainstem relapse with a, a lesion in, in the brainstem. A huge elevation of neurofilament here. It was started on, well, first fingolimod, and then we had this result coming back, and then with natalizumab, still increased a year after a new T2 lesions, but new gadolinium, so it was transplanted. And you can see this kind of drop. I mean, we don't really know how long disease activity keeps on. Uh, so this is uh, actually what perfectly normal neurofilm. And the problem is he's progressing. So he's now experiencing weakness also in his right leg. Uh, also did neurophysiology to <coughs> exclude a peripheral uh, cause of this, but it was uh, without remark. It's a problem. So this tells us we need other drugs or other treatments. Uh, maybe I can turn to John Vito and <laughs> um, I think we also need other biomarkers uh, for progression. Uh, so there's more to MS than just B and T cells, and I would say that at the initiation of disease, I mean, it's, it's good to hit uh, the adaptive immunity, but with time you will have other types of disease uh, processes commencing. Um, and we don't know, I mean, uh, I'm not convinced that any of our existing drugs really has an effect here. Um, we have a lot of different disease pr processes that might be work as targets. Um, you can also see in, in randomized controlled trials, if you, if you divide, uh, I mean, those that have pub published data, for example, dimethylfumarate, fingolimod, and natalizumab, uh, about 75% of the relative benefit of being on the uh, active drug is among those younger than 40 years of age. So um, with our existing therapies, we don't have that much effect here. And a lot of the neuronal injury occurs here. Uh, if you just look hard enough, for example, using markers for, for neurodegeneration. So in conclusion here, um, among our choosable alternatives today, anti-CD20 offers many advantages over existing DMTs uh, with regard to efficacy, also safety and tolerability. Uh, for example, fertile women planning pregnancy, uh, you will have a long-term effect and, and uh, you don't have to, to give a new uh, treatment during pregnancy. Uh, that this is a big problem with drugs such as fingolimod where you have to stop the drug well before uh, planning a pregnancy. Um, with long-term safety, Special infections, I think we have to look further and, and wait for the data, but we probably could optimize treatment algorithms to, to minimize risks further. Uh, and the future, of course, the more selective targeting of, of these T and B cells and to identify druggable CNS inherent disease mechanisms. So, uh, yes, in general, anti CD20 is the only DMT you need for the time being. <laughs> Uh, especially since we know how it works. That's always good. Uh, yeah, it's a big group of people. Even Gavin, I put you up here too. You're an advisor in this combat group, you know. Thank, so. thank, thanks very much, Frederick.